Welcome back to Third Eye Weekly. Today we're here with Andrew Lawler, a journalist and contributing correspondent to Science Mag, where he recently published a feature about the isolated people that were discovered deep in Peru's rainforest. Thank you so much for joining us today, Andrew. My pleasure. So how did you first come to hear about this tribe that's living on the Karanja River? Well, we've been covering the story for the past uh, few years. And what's happening is it, it seems as if some of these isolated tribes are beginning to come out of the forest. And it's not clear why. So we decided that it would be best to uh, actually go and find out. So we found a, a couple of uh, nonprofits who do work on the Karanja River. And uh, we heard that that was a good place to go because there are a lot of uh, isolated tribes as well as indigenous villagers who have had contact with these isolated tribes. So our goal was not to actually meet uh, uncontacted tribes because then of course they would be contacted, uh, but instead was to gather intelligence on why these people are beginning to emerge from the forest. So what were some of the first instances of contact with these indigenous people of these uncontacted tribes? Like how did they know that they were all coming out of the forest now? Well, let me lay it out. So you have, um, you have indigenous people who used to live in the forest, but who now live settled lives mostly along the riverbanks. And some of those people have emerged in the past one or two generations. I, I met with several older men who recalled, you know, growing up naked in the jungle and living uh, very much outside of the modern economy. Uh, but they've been integrated somewhat into Peruvian society now. At the same time, there are their, their cousins in the forest who are remaining there, who are choosing to remain in the forest. Uh, but what's happened in the past couple of years is that some of these isolated people suddenly are showing themselves, which is very unusual because for the most part, they're terrified of coming out because they're afraid that there might be violence, that they might get disease. So there's a lot of reason for them to stay put in the forest. Have you personally seen any of these isolated peoples? We did uh, meet with a, a semi-contacted man named Ipa. Uh, he was kind of a mythical figure we kept hearing about as we were moving up the Karanja River. We kept hearing, well, you know, Ipa, the Ipa people, the people associated this man with the uncontacted folks further upstream. So as we went from village to village and interviewed people, uh, we realized that this is really a, a, that he is really a key figure. And finally, we were able to meet with him and his two wives and mother-in-law who live in a really interesting uh, settlement, it's not quite the word, but a, a, a camp just beyond the last village, the last village where indigenous people who are in contact live. And uh, it's a, it was kind of a rough hut made of palm fronds. And he still makes his living by using a bow and arrow to hunt food. Uh, they gather turtles. They live in a very, very traditional way, although they do have clothes and they do have an awareness of what's going on in the outside world. Ipa and one of his wives have actually been to the villages and have actually gone to a, a fairly large town that is a couple days downstream. So, you know, he's a bridge between the people in the forest where he still has family and those people in the villages who are encouraging him to come out. But what happened was that in October, when all the villagers went downstream to vote, when they came back, all their stuff was gone. And I mean their machetes, their pots, their pans, and these are people who don't have very much. So they knew that the isolated people, that Ipa's family and friends had made a coordinated attack on these villages. So we were there in part to find out how that happened and what the aftermath is. So what has been the aftermath? How has these these individual um, indigenous tribes kind of been retaliating in the way that because of these isolated tribes coming to steal their their tools well it's it's interesting because the the villagers themselves never used the word steal or thievery they said you know these people came to harvest and if you think about it it makes sense if you live in the forest you come across a tree with bananas you take the bananas you don't ask who owns it so uh, the villagers understand that these people in the forest don't have a concept of private property, that they're just coming and taking things that they need, like machetes and pots and pans. The question is why? Why now and not five years ago or 10 years ago or 10 years from now? And the answer seems to be that things are changing in the forest. There are, uh, there's fewer 
fewer trees in the forest. Uh, the forest is actually shrinking. There are also uh, a lot of new people entering the forest. You have drug traffickers who are moving cocaine from uh, the Peruvian highlands through the forest and into Brazil, where, which is now a very large market. Peru is the largest exporter now of illegal cocaine. You also have illegal loggers who are working there. You have miners, you have oil development. So you have all these people who are beginning to come into the forest for the first time in large numbers. At the same time, you have the tribes within the forest, these isolated peoples who have less space, so they're beginning, they're beginning to fight with each other from what we can tell. So there's a lot of pressure on the, the weaker ones like Ipa and his family to move closer to the settlements where they can harvest things like machetes, which are very valuable, and hopefully uh, not uh, have to face violence uh, within the forest where it is getting to be dangerous. So speaking to those changes, for those that do wish to remain living in isolation, do you think it's even possible now for them to sustain that kind of existence? Oh, absolutely. Uh, a lot of it depends on these people having uh, a safe, safe space. For them to have reserves, which the Peruvian government has begun to create, places where they actually, where, where it is actually illegal for anybody else to enter. Uh, and they're very strict about this. However, the, the government is putting so little money into this and so few resources that it's very hard to police this vast area. Uh, the area we were in includes two national parks and a, and a couple of reserves. It's the size of the state of Virginia. It's an enormous area and they have a very small budget. So the idea is there create reserves so these people can choose. Do we want to stay in the forest or do we want to come out? And that's the way anthropologists think is the best way to approach this. Uh, but to get the government to actually put up the funding and to provide people with protection, that's the hard part about this. We were wondering, how do you feel about plans concerning drone surveillance of these rainforest regions, possibly the government helping to fund that um, to better secure, understand what's going on in the rainforest? Well, it's a double-edged sword. Um, and actually, when we flew in to Puerto Esperanza, which is near the border with Brazil, we actually flew over a maloca, uh, or a, 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 an isolated encampment. Very rare to see these things. So using satellites or drones is becoming popular as a way to track where these people are. At the same time, uh, that could destroy these people's privacy and it could give people uh, who may not have the best intentions in mind a way to contact these people. I'm thinking of missionaries, I'm thinking of TV producers, because there's a big market out there for people to say, wow, look, uncontacted people, let's make a movie. Uh, and of course, the, the real danger here is in the contact is that they will get disease. Now, these are people who are at the tail end of 500 years of Native Americans dying from old world diseases, diseases that Europeans and Africans brought to the new world. So we have to be really mindful that any contact between Westerners and these people can be extremely dangerous and hundreds of people could die uh, from the flu, from uh, even from a cold that could spread along large numbers of people who have no immunity. So this is the real danger right now. So being so vulnerable, do you think that there are ways that the surrounding people could help sustain their kind of existence? Yeah, absolutely. The indigenous people who have come out of the forest are probably the best people to help guide these isolated people, in part because they themselves have developed, it takes two or three or at least three generations to develop full immunity to our diseases for these people. So the indigenous people who have already moved out of the forest and are living along the river uh, already have some immunity, so it's probably uh, better for them to be dealing with these uncontacted people because they understand them, they know that they're not stealing things, they know that they want what they want, they want electricity, they want clean water, they want cool stuff. A lot of the villagers had iPhones, uh, and, and as these isolated people start to come out, they're going to see these things and they want the goods. You know, it's interesting when when Ipa was in our boat, we were taking him downstream with his wife to, uh, to get some medical help. And uh, he was looking at our cameraman's stuff and he was fascinated. He really wanted to know what this stuff was. What is that? And you could see the wheels turning in his mind. So uh, I think we have to be careful not to romanticize these people that while they should be able to choose whether they get to stay in the forest or not, 
Uh, when you're given an opportunity, people generally want to come out and participate in, in that global economy. So do you think it's our modern society, do you think we have a moral obligation to sort of um, help maintain their culture in any way? Or do you think it's just kind of maintaining their ability to have a choice, really? Well, I think it's absolutely uh, incumbent on us uh, to help them. They don't have a voice. They, don't, they literally can't be heard. They're in the jungle. So who is going to speak for them? Who is going to stand up and say, you know, wait a second, these are very vulnerable people, and they're causing no harm, and they're just trying to live their lives without interference. How can we support that? Uh, I think that's the key. And most anthropologists seem to agree with that, although there's a lot, there's a dispute within the anthropological community about how to deal with this right now. Some argue that we do need to make contact with these people, uh, although I think most anthropologists feel very strongly that the best thing we can do is to uh, insist that these people have reserves where they can be protected and that they can choose in their own time to come out for help.